Good evening. Dear storytellers, dear screen industry colleagues, esteemed researchers, dear friends. Welcome to the opening ceremony of the Carla 2020 conference hosted by Women in Film International in collaboration with Carl International Film Festival here in Karlskrona, Sweden, as well as all over the world. My name is Johanna Koljonen, and I am one of five moderators sharing the task of guiding our exciting program over the next few very long days, designed to accommodate participation across time zones. And of course, whenever you miss something important, it will be available for catch up after the fact. This unique event has been made possible by support from the Swedish Film Institute, the Postcode Foundation, the Canada Media Fund, Screen Island, and Urimage and created in collaboration with Women in Film and TV Networks and with partner networks from six continents, as well as others, such as the Programmers of Color Collective, the Banff Film Festival, the Gina Davis Institute, and the Sundance Institute. Our gratitude to all of them is enormous, as is our gratitude to you for taking the time to join us, for taking the time to share this experience and perhaps to share should you wish your experiences in sessions, in workshops, and in social events. Starting now, which is Friday night in Sweden, and continuing to our Sunday night, we will talk about diversity and inclusion in the film industries. It is not too late to register, which is required to access for some of the programming, so do tell your friends to join us. It is still free. Our speakers are like you artists, trailblazers, trailblazers, researchers, activists, professionals of a wide range of backgrounds. And please, please help us amplify these voices. We are, of course, all familiar by now in this very strange year of 2020 with gathering virtually. But let us take a moment regardless to reflect on what that actually means. Unless you are driving, I would invite you now just for a few seconds to close your eyes. Feel that you are in a body, in a room, in a social context, in a geographic location. But also to feel that you are here in this shared space, in our temporary reality, into which we bring our cultures, backgrounds, norms, assumptions, our poorly translated idiomatic expressions. Our first shared language here at Carla 2020 is cinema. And our second is this, these words, which for convenience we call English and which we then wrestle with and stretch and, and struggle to make ourselves understood through. I myself am from Finland and English is my third language and there will be participants at this conference to whom it is their fifth and others to whom it is their first. We will speak in different accents. Sometimes we will speak on wobbly connections. Don't be shy to say, I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Can you repeat it? Could you say it in other words? It's always okay to ask again. We will be speaking from different cultural contexts. Words will mean different things to us and norms about which words are okay to use and which are unthinkable will vary even when no offense is intended. In particular, it is practical to know that language and categories around race and ethnicity are conceptualized very differently in different progressive traditions. And to try to hear past the words if someone says something that is startling to me. These conversations about our lived lives, our artistic journeys, our careers are joyful, painful, powerful. We will attempt always to speak the truth and be as brave as we can and as safe as we can. Before we move on to the conference's formal opening, it is my great pleasure to invite onto the screen my four moderating colleagues who will guide us through this weekend and sit down for conversations with our fascinating roster of guests. I will proceed in alphabetical order and also start, I think, at the greatest geographical distance. 
Melissa Silverstein is the founder and publisher of the Women, in Hol Women and Hollywood platform, which educates and agitates for gender diversity and inclusion in Hollywood and in the global film industry. She has a long background in writing and activism. She is the artistic director and co-founder of the Athena Film Festival at Barnard College, which is in the US, and recently launched the Girls Club, a community for women creatives, culture changers, and storytellers. Welcome, Melissa. Hi, Johanna. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Uh, could you tell us where you are and what is top of your mind right now? Sure. Greetings from upstate New York. Um, I have been uh, sequestered here since uh, March when the pandemic uh, reached New York City where I am based. Top of my mind right now is actually hope. We uh, had a really great de Democratic National Convention this week that was inclusive and so hopeful. And so my top of my mind is hope that we are almost through this incredibly difficult time. Thank you, Melissa. Temba Bebe's background is in international, international film sales, but has, uh, he has for the past three years been in charge of diversity and inclusion at the European film market at the Berlinale in Germany, curating and programming events, as well as creating external collaborations centered on the market relevance of diversity. He is also the indigenous cinema coordinator in charge of implementing new outreach strategies for the native indigenous cinema stand and the native fellows program at the EFM, as well as one of a founding members of the Programmers of Color Collective. Welcome, Temba. Thank you. Could you tell us where you are and what is top of mind for you right now? Um, I'm tuning in from my lovely home here in Berlin, um, where I've been based for the past two years. And at the top of my mind right now, all the really um, life-affirming conversations that I've had in connection with um, in the preparation for Carla 2020 over the past month, month and a half. And so, um, I'm just really looking forward to all of those conversations really unfurling and developing uh, during the conference and also afterwards. That's wonderful, thank you. Victoria Thomas is a UK-based filmmaker and film educator and the founder of Republic of Story, a boutique production company based in Edinburgh, which is in Scotland, and Tallinn, which is in Estonia, that focuses on developing and producing stories authored by women. She has produced both short and feature-length films across documentary and fiction, most recently the screen adaptation of Walking with Shadows, which premiered at the 2019 BFI London Film Festival. Welcome, Victoria. Do we have Victoria? Nope, we don't currently have Victoria. I'm hoping that she will join us in just a little while. Um, yes, uh, we'll move on uh, in the meanwhile to the UK and Wendy Mitchell, who is a journalist, moderator and film festival consultant. She is a contributing editor at Screen Daily where she previously served as editor in chief and is the editor of the European Film Academy's Close-Up magazine. Her latest book is Citizen Canine, Dogs in the Movies. Welcome, Wendy. Thank you, Johanna. Great to be here. Thank you. Can you tell us where you are and what is top of your mind right now? Yes, I'm here at my home in the UK, just outside of London, um, with my can poster. Oh, wrong way. My can poster. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, what's on the top of my mind, I actually, uh, you know, like most people, I've been at home for six months. And then this week I went to Norway, to Haugesund, to the film festival. And I just got back last night and I'm so grateful to be home. Um, I'm grateful I had the chance to leave my house safely and um, interact with some filmmakers in person. But now I'm so glad to be able to be home and yet be at Carla and feel energized by the people all around the world I get to talk to while sleeping in my own bed at night. So that's wonderful. Thank you, Wendy. And I, I should say in here that my top of mind is also I've just come home from Finland where I visited my family for the first time since Christmas. And probably I won't be able to go, go back for another year. And it is both joyful and heartbreaking, you know, it's very hard and lovely to have been there. All right, here we have Victoria as well. Welcome, Victoria. Thanks very much, Johanna. Can you tell us where you are and what is top of mind for you right now? I'm in Edinburgh at the moment in Scotland where I'm based and top of my mind at the moment is Carla. Really, I'm really looking forward to the weekend and all the amazing discussions and um, speeches that we have lined up. 
That's wonderful. Thank you, Victoria. Well, I think we should, we should get going. And to start off this opening ceremony, we will now read the value statement of the Carla 2020 conference together. As members of the global film and TV community working towards a more inclusive and just world, we share this statement as an affirmation of the values we strive for these next few days to reflect. We're committed to an intersectional framework in our fight for gender equality in all facets of life and work. We believe that Black lives matter. We believe that LGBTQIA rights are human rights. We will support and amplify the voices of artists that are undervalued, marginalized, or suppressed by politics or, or other circumstances. All right, was on mute. For those of us who hail from colonizing nations, we acknowledge that our ancestors claimed and plundered the land of indigenous peoples. We acknowledge that the wealth of wealthy nations was built on the exploitation of natural resources and indifference to the lives and suffering of humans perceived as other. We acknowledge that the cultural establishments of which we are part, which fund our work or control our visibility and status are still only at the start of a transformation towards true representation. We are committed to be part of that transformation and we are grateful for this chance to practice these values. We acknowledge that this work requires practice, resources, self-criticism and a real willingness to share power. We acknowledge that we all come with biases that the world we live in is racist, sexist, ableist, homophobic, anti-Semitic, classist, casteist, and colorist, and that it privileges those from the global north. As such, we acknowledge that we are all works in progress and that we will endeavor to do the necessary work to overcome and eliminate our internalized prejudices. We will call out prejudice when we rec recognize it. And when we ourselves make mistakes and are corrected, we will say thank you. Because when someone draws a boundary or is willing to teach us, they are giving us a gift of trust. We remind ourselves to listen with an open mind and a generous spirit to each other as we share knowledge, experiences, lessons, sorrows, and joys. We will assume that we dream about the same present and the same future, and remember that our past and our context have been and will be different. We will ask for clarifications when we don't understand someone's point of view or make a note to learn about it later if we can. We will embrace the complexity of the world and celebrate each conversation as a step towards shared understanding. And that concludes uh, the value statement. Thank you all. And of course, we will post this uh, on the website as well. Uh, we are now rearranging some, some chairs, so to speak, virtual chairs here on the stage. If the moderators are disappearing, that is why, but you will see them later in this session uh, and uh, as well, um, of course, all through this weekend. And in fact, uh, we are, um, I, I said before that I'm speaking to you from Sweden, but that of course is not an entirely, entirely uncontroversial claim. Uh, so we will move now for the next stage, the formal opening part of Carla 2020 to the land of Sápmi. Anne Laila Utsi is managing director of the International Sami Film Institute, of which she, she is also one of the founders. Anne Laila Utsi belongs to the indigenous Sami people and is like the institute based north of the Arctic Circle in the Sami village of Kautokeino in Norway. She is also a board member of the Arctic Indigenous Film Fund. A warm welcome to Anne Laila Utsi. When our own run work and most of our award winning films, the Academy of the 
to do. And here we are, these kinds of things do happen. We couldn't get sound on, on Anna Laila. We will try again because this is a recording and I'm sure we can make it work. But I think the practical, the most practical solution at this point uh, is that um, we take a little break, I think, and uh, hang in there and we'll try to be right back. Thank you for inviting me to Carla 2020. It is a great honor to be invited. And uh, I am really looking forward to follow the amazing program through the weekend. Uh, the world wants indigenous stories. Our films win awards all around the world. And most of our award-winning filmmakers are women, Amanda Kennell, Elamaya Tailfeathers, Mariam Bolnango, and so many other amazing uh, filmmakers. And Taika Waititi, of course, the Maori filmmaker who won the Academy Award for his film, The Jojo Rabbit. So we have some great men as well. Sami and other indigenous films need funding and support on the same level as any other films. Today, the funding for Sami films in the Nordic countries is unfair. We get uh, only one percentage of the national funding in the Nordic countries. And we expect all the Nordic countries to support Sami films, and especially feature and drama series production, the bigger productions. We have the right to define ourselves also through film as Sami people. The new generation of indigenous filmmakers is built on resistance. It is about telling our own stories, nothing about us without us. It is about defining our re reality. It is about retelling the colonial narratives it is about breaking the da damaging images of our peoples. This urge and this resistance and the constant fight is a fuel for a creative powerhouse. So our films are being made despite the lack of proper funding. The new generation of indigenous filmmakers creates testimonies of contemporary indigenous lives. It is important to tell stories that are not only historical, but to tell stories about indigenous people's lives today. And this change in indigenous cinema is significant because it defines us as living cultures, as living people, and we are still here, we are alive. I want to um, invite you all, wherever you are in the world, uh, to stop me to our homeland, and I want to do it with a, with a yoik. And yoik is our traditional way of singing, and it goes all the way back to the shamans, and they knew how to travel. And in these non-travel times, maybe this is a way for you to take a little travel here to Sami. Uh, and this yoik is called the Samiland Tundras. It is uh, a yoik by our great artist and uh, yoiker Ailuvash, he has passed away. And yoiking is a way of remembering, it's a way for us to connect to our family, our ancestors, our land and nature, and connect us to the whole. So,
ಸಾಮೇಯಂದೋತ್ತರೆ ತನ್ ಸಾಮೇಮಾನೋತ್ತು ಕಲಾಮಗಾರೇ ಕಲಿ ನ Thank you so much to you, Anne Laila Utsi. It strikes me, of course, that I am listening to this. You may not all be familiar uh, with uh, Europe's, I think, last remaining uh, indigenous nation, the Sapmis, and the La- Samis, and the land of Sapmi. Uh, stretches across uh, the what is now the, the geographical state boundaries of Norway, Sweden and Finland. And from the lands of Sápmi, we now move to the government halls of Sweden for a greeting from the Swedish Minister of Culture, Ms. Amanda Lind. Dear CARLA 2020 conference participants, wherever in the world you may be, in a completely different time and a completely different world, I would be standing in front of you right now, welcome you to Sweden and Karlskrona. But that's not the way it's turned out. In 2020, we are forced to adapt to completely new situations. 2020 was supposed to be a year with special focus on gender equality in the film industry. The 5050 by 2020 initiative was launched by the Swedish Film Institute in 2016 as a concrete effort to achieve gender equal film production, both in front of and behind the camera. And the initiative was adopted by film festivals and other industry events globally. And this year we had intended to summarize, to discuss and to look ahead. And it was my impression that the discussion about the situation of women in the film industry had also become more intense. The focus of the second anniversary of the Swedish Me Too initiative for film, Silence Action, was on representation and ethnic diversity. And the stories about social exclusion, discrimination, ignorance and racism were deeply disturbing. And I'm probably not alone in worrying about what impact the COVID-19 pandemic will have on discussions like this. When life and death issues take over news feeds, our thoughts and our conversations, it's easy for everything else to get drawn out. But the pandemic year of 2020 also seems to be a year when we raise fundamental questions about what kind of world we want to live. For example, the Black Lives Matter movement has touched us deeply and raised new questions, including how we deal with dark chapters in our own country's histories. The consequences of wrongs committed in the past affects the lives, the identity and the well-being of descendants of the victims to this day. And these memories arouse feelings of guilt and shame and are often met with silence. And that is why we must give visibility to the violations and to the abuse that groups such as indigenous peoples, national minorities and minorities have been subjected to. And in Sweden, the film Sami Blood became a milestone. It dramatically increased interest and knowledge about the history and situation of the Sami people. 
but it also opened up new possibilities for taking the work forward by political means. And in Sweden, the Swedish government recently took important steps to examine its own role in the historical violations and injustices committed against the Tornedalian national minority and the Sami indigenous people. And that's not something I'm very proud of. It is possible to deal with dark chapters in a country's history. Politicians, like myself, must be willing to try. We all must be willing to try. It's never too late to try to correct a wrong. Your role is important and your work is crucial. Film as an art form helps us to discover injustices and social exclusion in our time so that we can try to prevent history from repeating itself. Films can highlight those individuals and groups that have a hard time making themselves heard today. And in difficult times, it is particularly important that we continue to meet, if not physically, then digitally. More than ever, we need to share experiences and knowledge and hear each other's stories. The sense of isolation and resignation that easily engulfs us must be broken. And that is why it is so important that this year's Kala conference is taking place and driving these important issues further. So thank you for continuing your efforts. I wish you every success and I look very much forward to following your work. Yes, that was the greeting from the Swedish Minister of Culture, Democracy and Sports. I forgot some of those, Ms. Amanda Lind. And again, like looking at this with with, with an, an external eye, suddenly it does strike me that while we in the Nordic countries do have a lot of work uh, left to do uh, when it comes to, to justice and, and equality, we do have what would on the international stage be considered a fair amount of relatively young women in a lot of the Nordic governments. Um, and I think that that has, I mean, obviously I have my local bias here, but for me, it feels like that has, for instance, affected how we have spoken uh, about the pandemic and, and the many other big issues of the day in our countries this year. Now, for three perspectives, on the next few days, it is my great pleasure to introduce Helene Granqvist, President of Women in Film and Television International, who will be followed by Anna Serner, CEO of the Swedish Film Institute, and by Maria Jansson, who is a professor at Örebro, Örebro University here in Sweden. Take it away, Helene. Hi everyone and welcome to Kala 2020. I'm the president of Women in Film and Television International. It's an organization that spans six continents, about 50 member chapters. We collective, coll collectively work for change, inclusion and diversity in the industry. WIFTI runs program like 10% for 50-50. It's a rebate system for gender balanced productions. You can find more information about that on our website, wifti.net. We have three pillars. One is connection, and our mission is to connect our members all over the world. Another is knowledge. Our work focuses on sharing knowledge, experiences, and industry information and visibility to make women visible in front and behind the camera. To bring those pillars alive, we created Kala 2020. I believe that change happens when people start to really listen to each other. Change happens when those in position of structural power step aside and give way to marginalized voices. And change happens when we accept that there, is, that there is a problem and dare to work for a solution. Change happens when we reject the structures that doesn't serve us. My hope with Kala 2020 is to create a space where we can hear each other, see each other and connect with each other. Over the next few days, we're proud to be able to present incredible speakers, some of the leading creatives, researchers, executives and activists in the world, coming together for powerful conversations on intersectionality, representation, intimacy and the power of solidarity. 
We are also offering opportunities to meet, talk, and to get to know each other from all over the world, across the industry, and I'm hoping that we learn a lot from each other this weekend and that we'll create lasting connections. Our industry has the power to change the world and together we will be able to shape the sustainable future. Welcome to Carla. Oh, uh, I will announce my rock star, Sweden's own Anna Sanner from the Swedish Film Institute. Thank you, Helen. And I'm so happy and I'm so thrilled to be here. Uh, despite all May technical errors that we will be going through this weekend, it's so amazing that you have been able to achieve this digital platform for every one of us to be part of. When I started my work 10 years ago at the Swedish film industry, I never dreamed about seeing a conference like Carla 2020 actually taking place in Sweden, in the small place of Kalskrona, uh, but with participants and money from all over the world. I've always said as a mantra to myself uh, to get myself going uh, that stop talk and start to act. And you have all acted in so many different ways. And I'm so actually emotional that we can share the knowledge of every action, action in the whole world. The other thing I usually say is that money talks. And Carla 2020, it, it's, it would have been really something very new if that would have happened 10 years ago with money from all over the world. You heard about all the sponsors. They come from Canada, they come from Jurimage, they come from Ireland and Sweden. And the money says, we want change. Money talks the, langu the language of change in this matter. And the ones to make change is all of us together, not one, but every one of us going together by everything we have learned. We are working for change, for parity in the world. We are working everyone to have an equal right to our own voice, an equal right for every one of us to be part of this industry. And I'm very, very aware of our different privileges, where we come from in the world, how much money we have, how, what, a, what kind of structure our countries have provided us with, with the history. But as the value statement said, with our moderators so beautifully stating them, is that we ha have so much from the privileged part of the world to learn and to change. And we have a responsibility to listen and to learn. And if we can help and listen to each other, we can really make a change. There is so much power and knowledge in this platform that we will get to know when we are together during this weekend. So my hope and my strong belief is this conference will be the absolutely most a fantastic and successful conference ever because it touches on something that no one ever has done before and I'm so happy that we can be a founder and a part of it and to participate with it so I'm grateful to be here and I'm grateful that you are all here and let's just do this together after we listen to Maria Jonsson who is the next introducer. Hello, Carla 2020. I'm really touched on by your, by your speech. So I work as a professor in gender studies at Örebro University in Sweden. And my research centers on how policy shapes women's conditions. And currently I'm working in a project which focuses on the film industry. I look at things like public funding, film financing, quotas, 
and how these aspects affect the everyday lives of women working in the film industry. To me, Carla 2020 constitutes a unique moment for women in the film industry and scholars to come together. Scholars from around the world will share the results from their studies this weekend. And women from the film industry from across the world will share their knowledge and experiences, and not least, their films. As a feminist scholar, I am dedicated to the idea that feminism, to quote Bell Hooks, is a movement to end sexist, sexist exploitation and oppression. Accordingly, as I use feminist theory in my work to understand and conceptualize policy and women's conditions, I believe that in a wider sense, my research is also part of this movement. However, from studying politics, I know that research results, statistics, or for that matter, experiences, will not lead to change on their own. No, in order to do so, they have to be politicized. And by that, I mean that they have to be framed as pointing to relevant and important political problems they have to be tied to values that people are prepared to mobilize around. In short, they have to be used to spur actions of some kind. But this transformation from knowledge into action is not an easy endeavor. And it is certainly not on the job description of university professors or film workers. So for this to happen, we need to join forces, scholars and film workers, and for a moment, let go of our professions and become activists. So let us use this moment provided by Carla 2020 to master all of our resources and capacities to transform the research results, insights and experiences that we would share this weekend into relevant and important problems that we are prepared to act on. Let us take this movement provided by Carla 2020 to start a feminist movement, an international and inclusive movement, a varied and complex movement, a vibrant movement filled with the hope for change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria, Anna and Helene. Uh, it was a pleasure to hear these perspectives, and yes, I think we shall indeed be activists. It is time now for our opening talk. Uh, we are proud to welcome a longtime champion of the independent voice and of the social and cultural power of artful cinema. Throughout her long career in film and broadcasting, including many years as director of the documentary film program at Sundance Institute, she has made it a mission to lift up diverse voices and diverse storytelling forms. And in February this year, she was appointed director of the Sundance Film Festival. Please welcome Tabitha Jackson. Thank you so much for your kind introduction and hello Carla 2020. Uh, it's, it's wonderful uh, to be here. It's a great honor to experience the passion of your purpose and the rigor of your research. Um, it's said that there are two kinds of people in this world. Uh, those who can extrapolate from incomplete data uh, today, I would like to share some fragments of my thinking. Sorry, I love that data joke. Uh, I hope you got it. Uh, today, I would like to share just some fragments uh, of thinking. Um, and I will be brief. Um, it's, it's kind of my perspective on perspectives. Um, it all started when I consulted the artist, the Australian artist, Lynette Walworth. <clears throat> about how to think about this task I had accepted, becoming the new director of the Sundance Film Festival. We talked about watching, about seeing, about what is made visible and about who is seen. We talked about the philosopher Donna Haraway, who asks, how do we see? Where do we see from? Who do we see with? And she was the person who also defined the term situated knowledges as a means of understanding that all knowledge comes from positional perspectives. Our positionality inherently determines 
what it is possible to know about an object of interest. Lynette and I also looked at images. And in the Atacama Desert, there is an array of 66 telescopes turned towards the stars. Alone, each one is not powerful enough to reveal the depths of the universe astronomers are seeking to know. But combined, they have the power to reveal the structures of the system we inhabit, hidden from us by distance and time. I've become obsessed with this image and obsessed with this metaphor. My conception of the film festival this year is based on it, a multiplicity of perspectives and locations, determining how we see, not just what we look at, but where we look from. So another kind of science, another metaphor. Bo Lotto, the perceptual neuroscientist, says that our perceptual systems, not just what we see, but how we look, developed because, quote, at the root of human existence is the question, what's next? To answer this question well is to survive. It resonated because once again, we find ourselves embroiled in culture wars, in uprisings, in a moment of reckoning. And in a polarized society and a narcotic state, we are engaged again in a street, a street fight for truth, for meaning and the recognition of the arts and culture as a necessary and urgent public good. We are also in the middle of a global pandemic, a planetary scale problem, a climate crisis, a planetary scale problem. So what do we need to equip ourselves with to answer the question, what next? We need planetary scale thinking. First and foremost, we need imagination. Imagination as a survival mechanism. At Sundance, we think about what we do as creating a space for imaginative possibility. And who better to do that than artists, those architects of the imagination? I was struck recently by a quote from an actor, Jonathan Majors. He said, I believe the arts are a service industry. We doctor different things. We doctor the invisible hurt. We mend the phantom pain. I believe, and I'll say to anybody, we are essential for humanity when we all come together around the campfire or around a television and experience something together that allows us to move through the world with a bit more confidence, a bit more security, knowing that we are not alone. Well, that seems essential to me. Artists as essential workers. I'm involved in independent media and I value it because the value of independent cinema is generally located in difference, in resistance, in opposition, in alternative representations. It's the most effective mechanism, it has been said, for the transmission of ideas. And film festivals like Sundance, like so many others, form together a circuit of meaning making. The best films, one might argue controversially, are independent. They don't exist to serve interests. Independence doesn't mean the same as it did in 1981 when Robert Redford founded our institute to free artists from the creative constraints of commerce and convention and provide an alternative to the studio system in Hollywood. When one of our theater artists was asked what independence meant to her, she said simply freedom. So let us together imagine how we might reassert independence for our times. Independence perhaps free from the risk averse constraints of market led creativity, free to break the form, challenge the audience, experiment. Free from the reductive tyranny of only Western storytelling structures. 
free to find the forms in which life is expressed in all its messy, beautiful complexity and ambiguity. Free from the benign shackles of the funder's agendas, free to speak our own truths. Free from being only revenue generators and data points for platforms in a capitalist system, and free to live creative, sustainable lives as makers with a meaningful connection to our audiences. Free from the power of homogenous gatekeepers to determine who gets their work financed, seen and distributed. And free to make independent cinema the ultimate frame of representation. In the words of Anne Bogart, those who can formulate the stories that make the world understandable will redefine the experience of those who live in it. My friend Lynette Walworth also pointed me to a quote by Wim Wenders who said the most political decision you can make is where you direct people's eyes. She said that Wenders was speaking to filmmakers, but his message is equally relevant to those of us who have the power to draw the eyes of the world towards new visions for our future, new versions of reality, and new possibilities for an evolving humanity. So back to telescopes. Yesterday, I was chatting to Professor Peter Gallison. He's a Harvard physicist who was involved with the creation of, and also made a film about, the Event Horizon Telescope. His film, The Edge of All We Know, premiered at the amazing CPH Docs Film Festival earlier this year. The Event Horizon Telescope was built to see something that no one had ever been able to see before, a black hole. The problem, for the power required, they needed a telescope almost the size of the Earth. The solution, they harness telescopes at different sites around the planet, including the Alma array in the Atacama Desert I just mentioned, and made all these telescopes look simultaneously at the same thing. It was a feat of international collaboration that turned these separate telescopes into one giant Earth-sized machine for seeing and for understanding. Shep Dolman, the project lead, described it like this, quote, imagine taking a mirror, smashing it with a hammer and distributing these shards all over the world, then recording what happens on each of these shards and bringing them together again and reconstructing that mirror. That's what the Event Horizon Telescope was doing. The experiment was successful and in April last year, the Event Horizon Telescope captured the first ever image of a black hole. And I urge you to Google it. It's the metaphor for the festival this year, for Sundance Festival, but it's also as we engage in Carla 2020, I think a useful metaphor for our field for the industry, for the endeavor, for the movement of film and media. We talk about culture as being the mirror held up to society. So what if, my two favorite words, we can learn from the ambition, the cooperation, the global collaboration and the imagination of the Event Horizon Telescope as an industry. An individual empowered or resourced with a camera and a point of view can record an experience, a shard. If we believe in the mission of art and culture as meaning making, we as an industry have an opportunity and indeed an obligation to bring all those shards back together, to reconstruct the mirror, to gather and disseminate the meaning that is made. And in its multiplicity of perspectives, its global inclusion, I suspect we might see something that has never been visible before. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much. Thank you. And I think if anyone like me had tears in their eyes listening to this, you will be happy to hear uh, that all of these talks, of course, will be available to share very soon. Um, we will continue with an essential worker uh, next. We will hear from Amma Asante, a multi-award winning British writer and director whose successful career is very long and of course ongoing. But I will mention two points of special interest to me. In 2016, her feature, A United Kingdom, became the first film by a black director to open the BFI London Film Festival. And the following year, she was named an NBE by Queen Elizabeth for services to film as a writer and director. She sits down now for an opening conversation with my colleague, Melissa Silverstein. Please welcome Alma Asante. Hello, can you all hear me, Ama? Hi, how are you, Melissa? Hello. I can see you. How are you? I'm good. That was so inspiring. I'm kind of like a little verklempt, as they say, to follow her. Um, okay, so I want to start with part of the conversation that you and I had earlier this week. And there was one point, there were many points that have stuck in me, but one particular point where you said you wake up every morning full of ideas like a painter and a musician and um, that really resonated with me and I want to talk to you a little bit about that and your gift of storytelling and, and these ideas that are flowing with within you all the time what is it about storytelling that makes you so passionate yeah, well, I think I, I um, and you've been so kind, Melissa, thank you um, for allowing me to preface it, because I was talking about that in the context of saying it's we live in a world where as women and particularly as black women, we we have to spend a lot of time talking about those two things in relation to our industry and what a world it would be if we could wake up. Um, every morning and think about our work and actually have to talk about, the, be allowed to only ever talk about the craft of our work um, and, and be able to do what we're really good at instead of being placed in a position where that the industry and the world is created where we have to be activists as well. It may not be our forte, it may not be what we're most brilliant at, but in order to work, we have to in some ways, you know, you know push for the right to work. And so, um, what is it about storytelling? It's so much of what many of the speakers who have spoken ahead of me, who have been the introducing speakers have said today, um, which is that it's a way of being able to communicate with the world. It's a, it's a way of being able to communicate with each other and I think open windows into um, worlds that we perhaps haven't thought about or into worlds that we, 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 we might like to think about, but we, we, we simply, there is no other way to walk a, a human being in the shoes of another person than to place them as an audience member in a film, watching a film and have them walk in the lead character's shoes for, for two hours. And that's why, you know, film is so important. Film and television is so important because it's a way of immediately transporting us into experiences that we may never have thought of or don't know how to um, necessarily, you know, un understand in a way that's wider than our own perspective. And I, I love that. And sometimes it can be about things that are very, very serious, as many of my, my films have been about. And sometimes it's just about being able to laugh through the lens or the gaze of somebody else and with somebody else, you know? What you have done through your films, the ones that most of us have seen and know about, um, is to center a perspective of people that have not been centered in our culture. They have been marginalized, telling the stories of the people who are missing. Um, and for me um, to have that gift, and I think that's the way I want to frame it in terms of the gift to see things that we aren't taught in education and allowing us, and you can process it so differently with it through, through the visual medium. So I want, always want to thank you for you giving us this gift, but I... I feel that what you what you do, and I would like you to elaborate a little bit on this, is how do you take the small 
they're not small stories, but how do you take the, the perspectives of these individual people and make them universal? Like, talk a little bit so about I know what I And I know what you mean when you say small, you mean intimate. It's right. like the intimate um, stories of their lives and the details of our lives. Well, I was extremely lucky um, with my first uh, film uh, that I was making, A Way of Life. Um, in that I, and I, I wanna preface again what I'm about to say, in that I've worked with people who to me are beacons of the industry. They are people who did not have to offer me opportunities of pathways to tell my stories and yet they chose to, even though their stories themselves were seemingly very different to mine. Their experiences of this life and this world were very different to mine. And one of those people was a man called Peter Edwards. And he was the producer of my first film. And of course, you know, on the surface, he's white, he's male, he's the opposite of me in so many ways. And yet he taught me when I was um, worrying and lamenting one day and being very anxious about how my first film would translate to other people outside of the experience. He told me that in the, in the detail, you get the universal. And this has stuck with me forever, ever since then. The idea that in the detail you get the collective. And what that did was free me in many ways to focus on the, the, the authenticity and the detail of each character's life. Um, whose story I'm trying to tell or, or through whose lens I want people to experience the story through. And when we, we focus on that detail, we get an authenticity. And when we get an authenticity, we get something that collectively we all have a way of understanding. And I've always felt that audiences will always be far more um, genius and experienced um, and perfected at what they do which is watch movies than we as filmmakers because audiences will watch more movies than we'll ever make, even if we're Scorsese or Spielberg. So audiences have a knack of being able to feel and sense and experience what is, what is inauthentic. They know immediately, they switch off immediately when they know it's inauthentic. And so for me, the, the hard work has always been in the research whether it's a fictional character or a, a historical character or a real life character and, and, and then finding the detail that that research has offered me to try and give the audience, um, you know, whoever they are, wherever they're from, whatever gender they, they are or however they identify an, an authentic experience. I want to build a little bit on authenticity because I think that is a word that's, you know, being talked about a lot and what the industry had did has done for a long time is you know not necessarily be authentic and um i want to give the example of a recent um job that you did which was to direct two episodes of mrs america which was aired here in the united states on hulu and i believe it was also in the uk and it told the story of the u.s second wave women's movement through the perspective of a woman who was very anti women's the women's movement, Phyllis Schlafly, played by Kate Blanchett. And you directed two of the episodes, episodes three and four, and the one that was put, was focused on Shirley Chisholm. And you said, I want to direct this. Like it didn't occur that maybe that should be the one you, they they suggested in some way. But you had to kind of be like this. Is well, in, in fairness, I mean, they so at the point where I sat down with the producers, they were talking about all the episodes I hadn't yet read. I was I was lucky enough to read episodes one and two and they were asking me to come on board. But they were also sort of pitching me and explaining to me what the rest of this series was going to be about, because if you watch it, it's. Um, it's very different to you might what you might expect when you first sort of hear the concept. So what I loved about it was that it was sort of going to focus around a different woman for each episode, even though it was a sort of continuing um, story within the context of that limited series. And so they were sort of throwing out all the other um, sort of women of the movement whose stories would be told. And when I heard Shirley Chisholm, I sort of said, "You've got to give me that one." I think, in fairness to the producers, they absolutely. Um, a, two things, wanted to ensure that, um, well, three things, wanted to ensure that all the directors were women, yay, on the whole um, series, and um, um, we did have one one male who co-directed with, with a woman, but other than that, all the episodes were women, um, that it should be, you know, uh, intersectional, 
um, experience should be represented within that. And so there was myself and, and, and Janixa. And, um, and, and I believe that a, a woman of colour should tell Shirley's story. Certainly it was a woman of colour who wrote the episode. So I, I think so. It's just that I wanted to make sure that I was the woman of colour who got that, that particular episode because I so desperately wanted to tell her story. And um, she should, you know, be on like the, you know, $5 bill here in the United States and whenever she's yeah. the first, she's the first um, woman to run for president in the 1972. And I don't know if everybody knows that. And, you know, here we finally have a, a woman of color as a vice presidential candidate. And it felt like there was a lot of, you know, Shirley in um Kamala Harris and the connections between the generations. And I think you you brought that out in that episode um, to give Shirley her place where yes. a lot of times people think that um, feminism is just really was just you know all white women and things like that. And yes, the erasure is real. It's right. real. Yeah. Right. And so recentering um, Shirley's power in this movement is vital. It's, it's really important and, you know, it, it allows me to feel like I'm playing my small part in contributing to culture, our culture, when I'm telling these stories. Um, and, uh, you know, this whole conference is about how far we still have to come. We have a long way to come. But certainly when I started out in this industry, you know, we were not telling Shirley's story. Shirley's story would not have been included in a show like this. When I first started out, so it's um, you know the, the the movement within film and within television is slowly but surely making a difference. It's it, we just need more. We we you know there's still there's still much work to be done and much work to be responded to by the industry. I think. Um, but I'm proud to have told her story. It was really important. You could absolutely draw a straight line between Shirley Chisholm and Kamala Harris, and I'm super super proud of that. Yeah. So, but what's so interesting is um, that your next story, one of the next stories, whenever it happens and people start filming again, is yeah. actually two white men um, in, you know, called Billion Dollar Spy, and that's been announced, and yeah. it's going to star two white men. So, I want to also talk about how you have, how women need to get permission to tell stories outside of, you know, just exactly who women are and why that was so important, why it is so important for you to break break out and tell different kinds of stories. Yeah, well, I mean, before I even knew I wanted to be a director or a storyteller, I obviously loved film and I loved television. I love visual storytelling. And, uh, you know, when I was able eventually um, to come across the work of um, someone like Julie Dash, I'm so sorry that you can hear my dishwasher going off, the joys of, you know, doing Zoom from home. Okay. Um, when I was able to to come across her work, uh, you know, she was a bit, you know, I, I, a big, massive inspiration to me as, as a writer as I was at that time. And, but as in terms of filmmakers, you know, most of the men, people I was exposed to as a director were men. And I looked at the work of um, Spielberg and Scors Scorsese, as I've mentioned before, and particularly with someone like Spielberg, and I use him often as an example, the variety involved in his work the variety of stories that he's been allowed to tell. You can go from something like The Colour Purple right through to, you know, to more of the work that, that, that one might think is, is more obvious for a storyteller like him. And I thought, wow, well, once I became a director, I thought, you know, when people ask me, what's your ideal career? It's a career in which I'm allowed to express a variety in that way. And, you know, I, for me personally, I feel I owe a lot to a film like The Colour Purple because it was a movie that gave audiences or proved to the industry that audiences could step into the experience of a black woman for two hours and could be, you know, enraptured and held by that experience. And I say, you know, because of that and other films that came, you know, before and after, I could make a movie like Belle. And so, um, for me, when I came across the story of Billion Dollar Spy and I absolutely connected to the story, I, I thought making a movie like this will 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 say much about me as a filmmaker and the body of work that I would leave I'd like to leave behind but also a lot about our collective experience as human beings and I am only humanized 
when as a woman and as a black person, I'm allowed to tell, you know, these, these stories and express and sort of um, platform the ways in which I connect as a human being to other human beings stories. It's sort of dehumanizing in a way to, to restrict my, um, my, my access to the kind of stories I can tell when we don't do that to white men at all. That's right. And Thank so you. that's why. Uh, we actually are out of time. That went by really fast. But thank you so much for sharing your story. And we look forward to seeing all your work in the future. Thank you very much. Good luck, Carla 2020. Back to you in the studio. And thank you so much, Amma and Melissa. That was inspiring and uh, joyful, uh, which uh, is extra awesome as well. From a writer director, we will now next move on to a broadcaster, media entrepreneur, entrepreneur and philanthropist. Mo Abudu is CEO of the Ebony Life Group, which includes, among other things, TV, film production companies, and a luxury and entertainment resort in Nigeria. She was hailed by CNN as Africa's queen of media. Today, she is in conversation with my moderator colleague, Wendy Mitchell. Please welcome Mo Abudu. If we can get Wendy on, I should say. There we are. Hi, Wendy. Hi, Mo. Good to see you. Good to see you. It's good Thank to see you. you for joining us at Carla. Uh, we are so glad you're here. Um, Johanna gave a short introduction, but I would also like to point out that you're also called by Forbes as Africa's most successful woman. And mm -hmm by the Hollywood Reporter as one of the 25 most powerful women in global television. So, yes. Um, and I was lucky to meet you when I was doing some work in Nigeria a few years ago. And, um, you know, you've, you've also been called the Oprah of Africa. But you know what? That That's not even correct. You're, you're, she might be the Monroe of America, really. <laughs> All these titles. I am just... Poor little Mo, just Mo. <laughs> okay, thank you, Mo. You're always so down to earth as well. Um, you know, we we thought you would just be perfect to talk here at Carla. We've already we've only been started for half an hour, and we've already heard from about eight really inspiring women. Um, we're going to be talking a lot at Carla about carving out your own place in the world or in the industry, and sort of not waiting for permission to mm. do that. And that's one thing I love about your story. You were so entrepreneurial, you started Ebony Life TV. Okay. Um, can you tell us about that moment and why you were confident enough to start your yeah. own network? Yes, Wendy. Um, you know, I, one thing that I always say to my friends, my family and anyone around me is that it's so important to find the things in life that you're passionate about. When you find what you're passionate about, then ultimately that translates to you finding your purpose in life. And once you've found passion and purpose, I think those are the two major items. They're the two major driving forces for success. They're the things that are gonna, even when the challenges are there, even when things aren't going the way you want them to be, once there's purpose and once there's passion, I think everything else kind of falls into place. So for me, for the longest time, I've always wanted to be involved in telling our stories. I was born in England. For the longest part of growing up in the United Kingdom, you know, you're being asked sometimes the most ridiculous questions about who you are. And for a long time, I decided not to do anything about it. I am a HR consultant. I worked with ExxonMobil for many years. I got into hospitality. And I thought, if I make a leap into media, people are going to think, is she okay? Which did happen, by the way. When I made the leap, they're like, is, Mo, is everything okay? Because I turned 40 at the time. So maybe was it a midlife crisis? What's going on? What's going on? But I think I finally decided to face up to what I was most passionate about. And it was what was in my heart. And it was really about telling our stories. And I believe that once you found what you are passionate about, as I said, things do fall into place. Hmm. So what was I gonna do? It started with me deciding on a talk show. 
Now, the re that's where the title, The Oprah okay. Africa yes. came from. And so when this journey with the talk show started, um, I met with a few people in the business world in Nigeria to convince them to please support because in our part of the world, the only way you can get anything on television is you need sponsors. Sponsors need to find value in what you're doing. So I went around pitching this idea about this talk show. It's gonna be about this. It's gonna be about ordinary people doing extraordinary things, celebrating the best of Nigeria, et cetera, et cetera. It took a minute, but eventually I did get support. And the show went on to Multi-Choice, onto DSTV and ran for several years. But then I found that it gave me a platform through which I could engage with so many different types of people and tell so many different types of stories. I felt there must be more to this. And then I started thinking about launching a network. Now, again, everybody thought I was pretty bonkers. You've done a TV show, you've done a talk show. Now you want to launch a network? And I said, yes, I do. And you know, once you put something out there, you kind of have to kind of like find a way to just, you know, make it happen. Hmm. So being a consultant, coming from a HR background, I always start with these massive presentations and, you know, sort of doing PowerPoints and you're going around and you're, again, you're looking for support that, you know, I want to do this network and these, this is the value, these are the opportunities and for all the different brands involved. And I pretty much, it took me about three to four years mm -hmm. to get buy-in to this network because I'd never done it. I mean, I'd never done a TV channel. I'd never run anything like that, but I just sort of thought about if you can think something, you can do it. And it's, 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 it's how I end all my talk shows. And I always use those words to encourage everyone out there to say, if you can think it, you can do it. Now, what is a TV channel? A TV channel is, it's, it's, it's a schedule of programming. It's okay, so what sort of programming did I want to have on this channel? I wanted to tell our story in such a way that it had never been told before. Sort of focusing on this global black woman, this global black person, this global millennials that needed to have a platform. It was incredible that then, I mean, this was only 2012, it didn't exist. So we're, you know, we're finding all these gaps in these spaces and saying there wasn't a talk, there wasn't a Pan-African talk show that existed. Yeah. There wasn't a TV platform like mine that existed. So it was now, yes, you know, black stories matter. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's almost cliche to say, um, you know, we're changing the narrative. But back then, it was really difficult to get a foot in the door to say, this is what I want to do. This is how I want to launch this channel. This is how I want to make this channel happen. Um, it, it, it took a minute, like with everything. I mean, I could be here till tomorrow telling you how we got the channel started. But I thank God we did. I have an incredible team. I still have that team that we worked with. We were putting together show ideas, we were producing the shows, we were editing the shows. I mean, we literally had over a hundred people working with us from editors to those that were writing scripts to researchers. It, it, you know, it was an incredible um, opportunity that we had. And I, you know, and the memories of that will always, always be with me on how we started. Absolutely. Yeah. It's amazing what you built. Um, were people ready to see a woman run a major media company? in Nigeria? Did you, was that something you had to change perceptions on? I think that, I think women were challenged globally. I mean, I, I spoke about this last week. I, I had a post on my page that I said that, you know, as black women, we face what I call double discrimination. I mean, we all know that women are discriminated against point blank, but then we also know that black women are also discriminated against. So there are two levels of, of that discrimination that we face. And Nigeria is still very much, um, the media is still driven by men in, in, in our society. So to a certain extent, I mean, you know, people will look at you and think, okay, let's see what she can do. Because I'd been in hospitality before then, I'd had some level of success, you know, in my career. So they were like, okay, let's, let's, let's see how she's gonna do this. And it's almost as if some people are waiting to see, is she gonna make this? Is she gonna fall? Is she gonna be successful? And then, you know, so, so you're under, in, in, you're under intense pressure to keep doing, to keep making sure that you can be successful because failure is no, it's not an option. It's not an option for me. So you just keep pushing, you just keep, you know, you, whatever comes, you just take it on the chin and you just get up and you say, it's another day. What do we need to do to, to you know, to keep moving on? So people, some people may have felt that, okay, is she gonna make it? But they don't say it to your face, kind of behind your back. Yeah. <laughs> and with, you know, the sort of films that I've seen that you've produced have opened my eyes a different way to 
maybe successful businesswomen in, in, in Africa, not just in Nigeria, not being shown the same tropes as we see in Nollywood, for instance. Um, what kinds of, of voices do you want to champion right now? What are you looking for? I want to champion, of course, women is number one on my list. I want to tell stories about women. And some of these stories could be inspirational in that it's about a great woman doing great things, but it could also be a story like the most, our most recent film coming out soon, which is about human trafficking mm. and how many of our women can get caught up in that. So yes, it's definitely about championing the female cause, but within that also, it's about making sure that we can tell a range of stories from those that are very inspirational to those that are areas where we want to warn and say, these are the dangers. I think someone needs to be giving a voice and a narrative to those sorts of stories as well. Yeah. But you know, Ebony Life is known every Christmas for bringing out a jolly, happy movie that people are gonna to go to the box office and watch and they're just gonna be the, oh wow, this is wonderful. And we started that with 50, which was in 2015. And I think we met, we met then. Yes. Um, and then we went on to do the wedding party, one, the wedding party two, um, then Chief Daddy, then Your Excellency. They've all been a lot of fun. Um, but within the fun, there's also a, a message in, 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 in all the films that we make. But it's, it's you know, so we started with, with TV, then we got into film. Um, and then as you know, we recently opened Ebony Life Place, which is a luxury and entertainment resort in Lagos, where you can actually live the experience of coming to watch a great movie or have, you know, have dinner or, or have your, you know, your intimate events and things like that. So but we really want to play in that entire space of you being inspired and also living um, within that. I love that. I can't wait to come back to Lagos and you got to come up at the place. Um, do you think the world uh, globally is opening up to being open to more stories from Africa, di different kinds of narratives that they might not have seen before? I cannot tell you how much the world has opened up. I mean, I had been going to MIPCOM and MIP TV probably for about 10 years. And what I love about our business is everybody's always so polite. It's always, oh yes, that's a wonderful idea. Yes, we must, here's my card, you know, and you're sending email after email, you're not getting any responses. You know? So for the first four, five, six years of going to me, that's exactly what happened. I mean, I would leave really excited. Yes, I've met this person and I'm, something great's gonna happen. But unfortunately it didn't happen, but it happened um, in 2018 um, with Sony. As you know, we signed um, um, you know, a three scripted deal with Sony then, but what we had, to do before signing was to go back and do the work, which was about investing in IP, mm. was investing in research, was having a development team that was ready to put together these incredible story ideas that we could take to the world. Now, the thing about saying, do they want, does, does Hollywood want our stories? They do want the stories, but they want a particular type of story. They want a story that is gonna have global appeal that mm. yes, it can be an African story, but what relevance does that have for the world and how can the world relate to those stories? Mm. So it's, it's really about getting the format and the storytelling right. And I think that we are in a really good place now because you know we've done the deal with Sony, we've done the deal with AMC, um, on an African you know, sci-fi series. We've done the multiple deal with Netflix as well, amongst a few others that I can't mention because you know, they, they're yet to be announced. So you know, we are getting to the point of where we're understanding the types of stories. You know, Hollywood wants scale. They want big stories. So I mean, a couple of times I've tried to sell a couple of you know, intimate stories. They're like, well, it's too intimate. It's, it's, it's not big enough. I need big. I'm like, you want big? Don't worry, I'll give you big. You know? <laughs> so yeah, they do want. So just to say to everyone out there that's listening today, please think big, look for something that's going to resonate globally around the world. You know, I keep saying Africa has been so silent for so long, yet we have so much history. We have so many stories to share with the world. And this really, there's no time better than now for us to get out there and to tell these stories. No, you know, I'm so impressed by, yeah, these deals with Sony, with Netflix. And like you said, they might want a certain kind of story they think, but yeah, how do you juggle that with not just the bigness, but telling stories that you think represent the Africa you want to show as well, not just what the person in LA might want to see from Africa? Absolutely. It's really about making sure that we also have the right agenda because, as I said, we're very female focused. So 
the first story that we sold or that we not we didn't sell it that we have a co-production deal on with sony is called the dahomey warriors now this is a beautiful story about these incredible african warrior women that lived hundreds of years ago that were out there fighting on behalf of their nation i mean what is more inspiring than that so you know they they they, they saw that it could be big they saw the scale within that and said you know what we need to do this story so it's 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 so for us a lot of the focus is on um women it is on telling stories that are rather unusual some of them are on resources as well um you know the, the hunt for resources um because as you know africa has all these resources but what have we done with them and have we used them to the to the best of our potential so for us it's really about looking at what's topical what's relevant and saying how can we drive this narrative to ensure that there's also a message, a message for the world and a message for us? And at the same time, not forgetting that we need to entertain our audiences. We need to excite our audiences at the same time. I think that's one reason you've been so successful. You realize it's not just what the creator wants. We have to think about the audience as well. Um, we, we have to start wrapping up, sadly, but I'm just curious, you know, You've done so many different things in your career, also with your philanthropy. Um, you know, yeah, you have Ebony Life Place. You've got a whole place yes. uh, that lives in addition to the media empire. So what, what are the goals for the future? Where do you go from here? What's next? I think we have such a massive slate of programs and of production to do. We're gonna be tied up doing that for a long time, but I would also like to get involved with programs that help empower our women and our young girls and I'm going to be doing a lot more of that that is something that I'm passionate about and I must find my own time to do I recently became a grandmother so you know um, I want to spend time with my grandson and more grandkids to come um, and I want to just keep you know thinking up these incredible stories that we can share with the world and it's so exciting when you've created something and you know you you push it out and they're like oh we love this idea there's nothing more rewarding than that than that you're going to get an opportunity to create something um you know that people have that people have bought into it's, it's, it's a beautiful feeling wonderful um and any parting words or advice i mean you for the people listening to carla uh we've got so many people around the world yes. um would it be to think big it's to think big. I would say if you can think it, you can do it. Never be afraid. I think it's important to actually do the things that you are most afraid of. If you're not afraid of the dream, then it's not big enough. So when you sort of get goosebumps, like, oh my God, can I really do this? That's when you know you're on the right track. Absolutely. Okay, everybody. I think that's really wonderful advice. Mo, thank you so much for joining us today. Been really thank great. Uh, I feel inspired and energized and my gosh, you're a hot grandma in addition to being a fantastic <laughs> mogul. Thank so you. thank you for joining Carla. Hope we catch up soon, thank you. Yes, and we'll go back to the studio with Johanna. Fantastic. Thank you ever so much for this inspiring session. So much, so many role models already. And I have to say this content has given me goosebumps at this point. So that is apparently a, a sign that we are now on the right track. Next uh, on the program, we had announced a conversation with Dr. Ulva Haber, but we're unfortunately experiencing some technical difficulties with that. Uh, we will make it available, of course, for you on demand as soon as possible. And the easiest way to find it will be by clicking through from the program, program page on our website, which is carla2020.se. That's C-A-R-L-A 2020.se for Sweden. And uh, this means um, that there, uh, we are, this session is drawing towards its end. I will pay, tell you three important things and then I will let you go. Maybe two important things and one bonus thing. Um, the first thing uh, is that what will happen next, uh, which is on the hour, which uh, in our time zone will be at 7 p.m. Uh, is a sort of introductory online networking session to which you are invited. Now, this sounds a little formal when I'm saying it like this, but I think it will be glorious and um, slightly chaotic at the beginning and then wonderfully fun. Uh, you can find an email in your inbox if you are already registered uh, to uh, this session. Otherwise, you can go to the Carla 2020 homepage, click on the program and just click through a link uh, on that um, under this, that 
program item to the Zoom call. Well, you will, we will all gather in the Zoom call. You will then be divided into breakout rooms with uh, some friendly, friendly strangers who are about to become your friends. You will have some um, instructions for what to do in the breakout room. And if you find in the breakout room that you have a better idea, of course, you are free uh, to to freestyle and, and change it, but, but there is a structure. So if you, like me, come from a culture where speaking to strangers is considered slightly very terrifying, um, you can go there and just rely on the structure to carry you through this socializing uh, element. And speaking of Finnish culture, uh, that would be the next thing I will tell you about, uh, which is a very important thing indeed. We have a special screening tonight at 8 p.m. local time, so that would be in about 90 minutes, of the film Force of Habit, which is written and directed by no less than seven women. We have 200 tickets for this screening. And the way this is going to work is that if you are registered to the Carla 2020 conference, you go check your inbox, there will be a link there and the first 200 or 200 people to sign up uh, to click that link can get a ticket to the screening. There will also be a Q&A uh, with the filmmakers afterwards, which is very exciting. And the third, uh, which is perhaps most important to me, but I still like to think of it as a sort of hot tip is uh, to tell you what happens at the beginning of the program tomorrow morning, because that is when I will return wearing my other hat as a media industry analyst. And in my session, which is uh, at the ungodly hour of 9 a.m. here uh, in Central Europe, the, I will talk to you about the Nostradamus report, which is an annual report that um, uh, charts the changes in the screen industries. Now we release our annual report in January. And as you may imagine, a few things have happened since then also in this industry. Um, and the, the, the talk that I will give tomorrow is based uh, on our past work, but also is, um, is an update of, of some of the, the most urgent changes that have happened during this year. We particularly look at our industry development in the context of macro trends. And I will talk about things like climate change, uh, political populism, uh, of course, the pandemic and the social justice movements that are happening and, and how these are affecting our industry. And I also am very happy to say that I will be able to talk also about hope um, because one of the things that we've observed this year uh, in the industry and in particular in the relationship between stakeholders ranging from filmmakers to, to cinemas, uh, that the relationship, um, the nature and the quality and perhaps the intensity of the relationship we have with uh, our audience members has changed in ways that I think is very constructive and hopeful for the future. Those were my three data points that I wanted to share with you. So on the hour, you can go into log into the networking online session and make some new friends uh, and professional contacts uh, in the Zoom call. Uh, check the web page for that or your, um, or your inbox if you're already registered. At 8 p.m. our time, you can go to the screening if you manage to nab one of the 200 tickets. Uh, and then uh, we will be back tomorrow morning uh, from this space. Of course, uh, on the webpage carla2020.se, there is already a ton of content. And I would recommend, for instance, that you go and take a look um, at the academic mini talks um, and some of the other exciting uh, speech and film uh, content that is already available. And it will be added to as we process uh, today's uh, show. Thank you very much from Carla. And uh, I will see you on the hour. Bye.